All right, I see our participant number starting to even out. So let's go ahead and get started today. Welcome everybody to today's event brought to you by the Council of State Governments and DA USA, bridging the gap between education and apprenticeship through industry engagement. I am Mary Wirtz. I'm a policy analyst with the Council of State Governments, and I will be one of your moderators for today. Next slide. Just a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we kick things off and I throw it over to my co-host. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and a recording will be shared with all registrants after the event, as well as this slide deck, which you'll see today. It should be shared with you in the next week or so, whether you are here live with us or watching it recorded. Please submit any questions you have for our speakers using the Q&A feature. That is the best way that we can keep track of everyone's questions. And if you have technical difficulties, please use the chat feature to connect directly with CSG staff. We'll do our best to help you. Next slide. And now I'll kick it over to my co-host Miriam to thank our funders for today's event. You're muted, Miriam. Thank you, Mary. Hello, my name is Miriam and I'm the project director of DIAC USA. We are a nonprofit foundation located in California and we act as an apprenticeship intermediary. Um, DIAC USA works with CSG on this um, webinar series about apprenticeships. And we, these webinars are funded by the German Federal, Federal Ministry and the Goethe Institute. Next slide, please. For those of you who are new to registered apprenticeships or haven't heard of it before, um, there are uh, seven main components that you should know about. Um, apprent registered apprenticeships are industry-led and apprentices who go through the program uh, um, are trained on an on-the-job training while they still receive supplemental instruction at a college or online, there are various ways to include the related um, supplemental instruction in an apprenticeship program. Those training programs are paid. So students who work on the job also earn wages. At the end of those programs, students receive occupational credentials and degrees. Program length, they can differ. They can go from one year all the way to four years. And there are various ways to develop, to implement those programs. Apprenticeships are also a great tool for diversity because those are trainings that are also great for marginalized communities um, and can create a new talent pool for industry. Quality and safety is ensured through various tools, tools with a registered apprenticeship, one being a mentorship component. Apprenticeship programs usually have a mentorship in component included, which means apprentices who go through the program are assigned a mentor by the company that they work with, and they ensure that they are guided throughout the process. Next slide, please. And now a quick word about youth apprenticeship and how youth in the US participate in apprenticeship before we kick it to our panelists who will talk about some model programs across the US. So youth apprenticeship, as you could probably guess from the term, just refers to registered apprenticeship programs and pre-apprenticeship programs for youth ages 16 to 24, and that's the US DOL definition. And youth apprenticeship programs can enable youth, young adults to receive high quality job training to become highly skilled workers in a rapidly changing job market. I probably don't need to tell anybody on this call about the burden that college debt in the United States places on youth and their families. And so apprenticeship as an earn and learn model can be a really incredible way to reduce that burden on young people who are trying to get job training. They include high level technical credentials that prepare students for a successful career, including that certificate of apprenticeship completion issued by the US Department of Labor. And they might be part of a student's career and technical education program, or they might be separate. And you'll hear a bit about both models in just a few minutes here. Next slide. A quick word on pre-apprenticeship, basically that is a program that prepares you for a registered apprenticeship program. And they're certainly not exclusive to young people. You don't have to be 16 to 24 to complete a pre-apprenticeship program, but it can be a job prep opportunity for a single profession or short-term opportunity for young people to shadow a variety of occupations within a given industry. 
And this is especially the case in a field like construction or manufacturing that's dictated by child labor laws where learners under 18 might be unable to perform many of the job duties in a normal registered apprenticeship program before they're 18. Free apprenticeships can also be used to get young people the necessary skills and certi certifications they need before beginning a formal program. And they're even being built into existing AmeriCorps programs across the country. There's a wide variety of approaches to pre-apprenticeship depending on which state you live in, um, but DOL has outlined the following six elements that any quality pre-apprenticeship program should have. And it should have an approved curriculum by existing registered apprenticeship program sponsors and have that industry involvement like we talked about earlier. There's a simulated experience with hands-on training or volunteer opportunities that are very intentional to not displace current paid employees. There's facilitated entry into a registered apprenticeship program. So the ideal pre-apprenticeship will directly place a student in a pipeline to an already established registered apprenticeship program. They help increase diversity in the American apprenticeship system by recruiting and preparing underrepresented populations to be successful and retain and state um, and increase retention in apprenticeship programs, pardon me. Um, they provide supportive services for program participants, again, to help people not just enter a program, but stay there and thrive. And they feature sustainable partnerships to further spread the word about apprenticeships and spread this model across other corners of industry. Next slide. A couple of quick stats from the U.S. Department of Labor on youth apprenticeship before we get into the presentations. There's been a 118% increase in the number of active youth apprentices in the past 10 years. Next slide. In 2023, one third of all registered apprentices were youth apprentices. I think that's what gets me the most excited. Next slide. And as of earlier this year, there were 25 youth apprenticeship intermediaries, youth serving organizations, and youth apprenticeship grantees funded by USDOL working to expand youth apprenticeship. And with the $200 million investment from DOL into apprenticeship programs through the State Apprenticeship Expansion Fund and the Apprenticeships Building America uh, grant program this summer. Um, that number is only increasing over time. So there is a lot of federal funding being invested into your state and across the country to help build these quality programs for young people that you serve. Next slide. But with that being said, now Miriam and I have set the stage and we want to kick it over to some leaders in the field who are actually doing the work of running a youth apprenticeship program every day so that you can hear a little bit more about their experiences, what they've learned and the challenges they've faced. So I'm very excited to introduce our three panelists for today. First, we'll have Sid Stewart. Sid is the founder and CEO of Better Youth, a social impact nonprofit based in South LA with a mission to build creative confidence, bridge resource gaps, and prepare foster and system impacted youth for, pardon me, for sustained success in the creative economy. Sid is a former educator for Girl Up, a teen girls empowerment initiative through the United Nations Foundation. And Ms. Stewart was a former director for Usher's New Look Foundation and LAUSD Beyond the Bell Arts and Education Program where she managed grant programs for two high schools and five community satellite sites in Watts. Sid is also a screenwriter and filmmaker. And as a youth advocate, Sid serves on the Career Technical Education's Advisory Council for LA Unified School District, the Advisory Council for the Foster Together Network, Steering Committee member for LA County Mentoring Nexus, and an inaugural member of National Leadership Cohort for Mentor. In addition, she was appointed to the California State Interagency Committee on Apprenticeships with the Division of Apprenticeship Standards. Then we'll hear from Andrew Castle. Andrew has worked in public education for 25 years. While the majority of his career has been spent as a classroom teacher, he has also served as a digital learning coach, a community school coordinator, and a teacher mentor. Additionally, Andrew served for six years at Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative as the technology lead for their Race to the Top grant. During this time, he oversaw the largest technology rollout in Eastern Kentucky, and he has taught physics, chemistry, astronomy, and computer science, so you can quiz him later. Finally, we'll hear from David Dorr. David is the director at the Somerset Career and Technical Center in Skowhegan, Maine. He has held that position for the past 11 years. Prior to getting into education, David served as an electronics technician in the US Air Force, 
and as a process control technician in a paper mill. He taught pre-engineering and robotics for 12 years before becoming a building administrator. David's experience in the technical field gives him a unique perspective about what students need to be successful in skilled trades. David holds degrees in industrial technology, applied technical education, educational leadership, and advanced educational leadership. Excited to welcome all of them, and we will start first with Sid Stewart. Sid, go ahead and take it away. Next slide. Thank you so much, uh, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here um, on this platform. Um, so I, you know, I'm Sid Stewart. I'm CEO and founder of Better Youth, and I appreciate the opportunity to share more about our work. And I'll be highlighting our organization in three parts: um, a little bit about our mission and org, our needs and barriers, um, impact and success um, to humanize our work. So we are boots on the ground as the kids say, 10 toes down um, uh, in the community. So we are based in the community, um, South Los Angeles, where the need is great for opportunity. Um, and we cultivate confidence, competence, career connections and community. Um, and we believe that talent training and technology um, is our success equation for transformation. And so um, our goal is to build the creative confidence. Um, at no cost, we provide these media arts training, um, skills opportunities, um, coupled with critical mentorship, professional skills development, paid work experiences, and the most critical part is social support um, to a community of foster and system impacted youth who have been marginalized. Um, and basically their communities um, ravaged by um, disinvestment. Um, so we aim to bridge the digital and equity divide and accessibility to activate these marginalized youth as the next gen powerhouses of the creative economy. And when I say a creative economy, specifically arts, media, entertainment, and tech. So we have a newly state federally registered apprenticeship program, um, which launched this April um, in tandem with our state registered, state and federal registered registered apprenticeship and our state registered pre-apprenticeship program, which we feel the pre-apprenticeship program is so critical. It's such a critical pipeline um, conduit for the success um, of an apprenticeship program and more importantly, for the success of young people in an apprenticeship program. So um, in conjunction with our root partner, um, Skydance Media, we uh, couple that pipeline together um, to give a two year trajectory of success for this community. Uh, so we offer you know, our technical skills training in four, five, sorry, five um, wrap occupations. Um, those occupations are animation, interactive gaming, filmmaking, um, video editing, project management. Um, and we have a multimedia artist category for above the line talent for producers and editors. And so, um, we're excited about that opportunity. Um, and we just registered another pre-apprenticeship program that's strictly project management because we feel that project management is a vertical that can be applied toward across sectors. As we saw uh, a year ago or two years ago, the strike had a significant um, impact on our economy here in California, um, particularly for creatives. And so, um, you know, with our program linkages, Better Youth strives to create a safe economic ecosystem for system impacted youth. Um, and we're just a dedicated team of arts education leaders, arts practitioners, professionals invested in elevating and championing emerging workforce talent, taking starving artists and making them working creatives while creating attainable pathways toward fulfilling careers to foster and system impacted youth in LA County. Um, so confidence, confidence, connections and community. But that doesn't come without needs and barriers. Next slide, please. So the most important part, and you'll see to humanize our work, that's Deja Smith and that's Jamia Palmer. Deja Smith just recently was hired by NBC through our partnership with the Television Academy. She was hired directly um, by Shondaland. She's working on her favorite show, um, Grey's Anatomy, and that's Jamia Palmer. She's an animator. She received a $10,000 grant from the NBA Foundation for her work um, in art. Um, but it is a difficult journey. I think when we know that the holistic approach to youth development is necessary in order to establish success and stability, um, and we seek to empower young people that hail from these resilient communities, 
again, ravaged by systemic racism, discrimination, and gener generational divestment. But outside of the obvious needs of financial stability, we provide mental health support, housing resources, nutrition, transportation with our partnership with Hop Skip Drive, and opportunities to establish healthy relationships with peers and caring adults for long-term personal and professional success. Because we know, we always say at Better Youth, that your network determines your net worth. And for a youth who comes from foster care or child welfare, they haven't had the luxury or the ability to develop healthy relationships or a network of people. I went to college, I'm a filmmaker, and I still need mentors and I still need a community. Um, and imagine navigating through life alone without these critical components. So 97 of our youth, percent of our youth don't have regular access to technology. So technology has become a basic need um, in, in addition to transportation and food and housing, because without technology, you can't bridge the digital divide and you can't learn what's current and the, the trends in technology change so rapidly. And so we try to provide that support um, with partners like Adobe and the Change Reaction to give personal laptops and software licenses so that youth have an ownership um, and invested um, in their own development. And lastly, elevating youth voice and stories is fundamental and critical to everything we do. We have a youth-centric practice. We always invite youth with lived experience to the table to inform and decide on policy and practice. We always say nothing without them, nothing about them without them. Um, youth sit on our advisory boards, our council. Um, and so in terms of our impact, we're very proud that some of our youth have received um, certificates from you know, DAS, which is the Division of uh, Apprenticeship Standards, state certificates. In 2023, we had 71 youth enrolled in our pre-apprenticeship and 55 youth receiving DAS certificates at their graduation. Um, this past year, we were featured on ABC. Um, and through our High Roads training partnership with the Brick Foundation, um, we are serving youth and providing additional placements, which include placements at Disney and Skydance and uh, Lionsgate and DreamWorks. And so when I run, when I run through this list, it seems like it's a highly successful and it is, but it is very challenging and finding employment partners who will take a risk and invest in our young people. Um, so our student involvement has grown 41% in the last three years. We have a 90% program retention rate um, and we aim to assist 70% of program participants in securing continuing education and career opportunities. So to, in closing, the earn and learn model, I am an advocate for the registered apprenticeship program um, and pathway because it combines college, on the job training, and for a population like foster youth, only 3% of youth in care ever make it to a college or university. We have 51,000 youth in care in California alone. It's the largest state with the largest population of foster youth. I sit on the IACA, which is the Interagency Committee for Apprenticeships for Foster and Homeless Youth, where we make legislative recommendations on how to serve this population, track results, and collect data. And so I am more than just the CEO and founder of Better Youth. I am an advocate for the apprenticeship pathway because I've seen success. And lastly, I'll share the success of Jeffrey Covington. His name, we call him affectionately Re. He came to us homeless. He's a 21 year old single dad from foster care. He is now duly employed. He's on his second employer rotation at GRX Immersive, a virtual production uh, company in partnership with Verizon. He's attending Los Angeles Community College for game design and he will graduate our apprenticeship program this December with a state certificate. He's stabilized through housing, employment, and he's shopping for a car this week. Um, so that is the success that I wanted to share and very grateful to be on this panel. And just wanted to say there was a quote from the new chief of, of DAS. He said, youth registered pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs offer a holistic ecosystem designed to uplift opportunity youth, dismantle career barriers, and offer youth the launch pads they need to ignite fulfilling careers. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present about better youth and our work in the community here in Los Angeles.
we can go to the next slide. Just I can brag a little bit about our program impact um, that I mentioned in in the the presentation. Um, but these are hard earned uh, uh, qualitative and quantitative data, and you know from a, an organization that started you know 13 years ago, we just received a 1.5 million dollar grant from the state of California. I, I when I run these numbers off, it sounds uh, glamorous, but it is not. It is hard earned work working with this population. And so when we see one youth, when we see one youth transform, that is success. Not all of them um, develop um, and they need extra time. And I think that's why a pre-apprenticeship program is so critical for the development of young people and allowing them to grow um, and glow at their own pace. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Andrew Castle, and I'm a digital learning coach at Johnson Central High School, uh, located in Eastern Kentucky. We're a very small school, and and Sid's kind of a hard act to follow. But um, I'll start by saying there there are some parallels between what Better Youth is there for and what we face as a small rural school district. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of parallels in um, sort of the disenfranchisement that's happened between those two, I guess. At types of area, uh, lots of lots of jobs lost, lots of, of programs gone, um, and, and it kind of caused um, it, it sort of spurred the need for our apprenticeship program, but also allowed us some opportunities. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, when we started, we started this program five years ago. Uh, the apprenticeship is fairly new. We've actually three years ago we sort of did a dry run kind of thing with the apprenticeship where. The bones were in place, uh, but we didn't pay our students. We've only actually had the full apprenticeship for two years now. Um, but we started out just with a help desk because we saw a need for for two things. One, we're a CTE school, a career and technical education school also. So we have welding and carpentry and, and culinary and, and things like that, as well as traditional uh, high school classes. Um, technology was there, but not in strength. Um, and, and being a... a a smaller school. We have under a thousand students uh, and we're a one-to-one -one technology school. So here we had, you know, 900 Chromebooks and all the teacher computers and the network equipment and the phones um, and, and funding in a small district is scarce. We had a very small technology department. Um, we kind of thought we have these students who want to take te technology classes. Why not have a student help desk? Uh, we started it five years ago. Interest was 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 great. We had a lot of kids want to do it, and we were lucky that we had. Um, I, I had just started as a digital learning coach out of the classroom, so I had um, the ability to watch these kids every period of the day, and it sort of fell into place where I had uh, a couple kids first period, you know, one kid second. Um, we had at least one or two kids every period of the day who could fill this role. So then we started thinking about the training we would need and what to do and, and got the ball rolling. It was a rough start, but it worked. And, and what we found was not only were these kids learning the technology stuff, but they were really reducing the load on the district technology staff and, and things like turnaround time for computers. Um, there was a time, you know, six years ago, if a student broke a Chromebook, they wouldn't have that Chromebook for a couple of weeks or maybe a week, or if, if a teacher's computer broke or their, their panel broke, something went wrong, or their phone went down, they would have to wait a while. And, and we've turned that around. If, if a student comes to our room with a broken device, a broken Chromebook, for example, um, most of the time, about 80% about of the time, our kids will fix it on the spot because it's usually a small problem, unless it's a broken screen or something like that. Um, and even if it's not, the kids will swap it out, give, give them a loaner, so we reduce the time that our students uh, go without technology. Uh, if a teacher's equipment goes down, our kids can jump in and take care of that problem quicker. So, so we see the need was there for to reduce barriers to education within the school. But you know, our, our program itself is for student learning. And when we were first pushing for this program, I kind of threw, I was passive aggressive with this John Dewey quote, 
and, and kind of used it to, to pitch the program five years ago. Give the people something to do, not something to learn. And the doing is of such a nature as to demand thinking. Uh, these kids really excel. Uh, we have kids who love technology start the program uh, and kind of run with it. We have, we have kids who aren't sure if they want to do the program and they start and they learn it. And, and I will say, we do have students sometimes who go into this and realize it's not for them. That's just as valuable as, as the students who go into it and succeed. Because, you know, as a high school, these kids are still learning what they want to do and what they don't want to do. Uh, but, our, but our kids are, are really good at this. And I had to include this quote, our apprentices fix stuff. That's what they love to say. If, if you ask them what they do, they, they'll reply, we fix stuff. That's, that's their motto. Uh, next slide, please. Um, some of the challenges we faced initially, um, year one, I'll never forget the first couple of months when these kids would walk into teachers' rooms to fix something. Some of the faculty were a little reluctant to have students work on their devices. Um, I did not expect that, but that was an issue at first because it was new. Um, but they're pretty much that problem is gone now. Our kids know what they're doing. Um, funding uh, was an issue and still is in some ways. Um, you know, we, if we want to start an apprenticeship program, how do you pay these kids? Um, and we, the, the district, um, year one, put up the money. Now, we didn't have a lot of kids, but the district, who is fantastic, agreed to put up the money to pay these kids part time. Um, two years ago, we something fantastic fell in our laps and uh, an organization called the Wilderness Education Project, um, led by Clay Sloan. Uh, did a, an apprenticeship grant, and we grabbed onto that. And so now for the past two years, and for the next, I think we have two more years left in the grant, they are allowing us to pay our apprentices. Um, you know, K-12 funding is always an issue. And to do an apprenticeship program, we have to have paid, you know, workers. Um, we were lucky in that we're a smaller school and didn't have a lot of kids doing it. So the district agreed to pay up front. The, uh, the grant has has allowed us to expand and, and really made things shine. So uh, we appreciate them. But we still have funding issues with, with parts, for example, and equipment. In, in public school, that's always going to be an issue for us. We just deal with it as best we can. And then time. Um, you know, you have, you have time-based apprenticeships and you have task-based um, apprenticeships. Ours is a task-based apprenticeship uh, with a check sheet that the students are given up front. They know they have to work through this to earn, you know, to, to complete the apprenticeship. Um, and they work at it all year long. Some students are able to complete it without spending time outside the classroom. But most students do, do spend time outside of the classroom to finish this up. Um, for example, we had, um, pardon the announcements that will to come. Um, they'll have to spend, um, Part of their fall break, we'll have we'll have students come in one or two days on fall break. Uh, when the district staff are working on servers, for example, or network equipment, for example. Let it free. Come to the office, please. Let it free. Come to the office. Um, but that's just par for the course. Um, last year we had some students who were really behind, and it was no fault of their own. Some of our kids are involved in a lot of activities, um, and they had to spend uh, about a week and a half after school, after they graduated to finish up their tasks so they can complete the apprenticeship. Um, but it works. And of course, the, the academic part, the learning part is built into a school. Um, our kids have to take um, digital literacy. Everyone takes that, uh, then help desk. And there's also a maintenance class they take as well as the help desk class. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and it kind of goes without saying, I almost didn't include this slide. Our integration with K-12 was built in. Uh, we developed this program in-house. Um, the Department of Labor, we had to go back and forth a couple times with our um, proposal for the task list and, and what, it, what, what we would be doing with our kids. But it was finally approved. Um, so this is, this is a homegrown program. Uh, our students work within the school, gain their skills within the school. Um, but it works because we do have so much technology uh, and and they they do get to work on the servers and the the network switches, uh, and the the telephone the telco switches in the in the server room, so that equipment is all here. We don't have because we're in a rural area, 
the opportunities to get some hands-on work with this doesn't exist. Um, we're trying to expand to a local hospital, but there's some issues there with um, privacy and, and HIPAA things to let kids work with their equipment. So we're not sure if it's going to happen or not, but we're trying. We're seeing where they'll go. But for now, we're, we're totally in-house on our skills, and, and we're lucky to have that chance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, once we got our program off the ground, um, we kept, we, we learned that there was a lot of interest in what we were doing and, and we didn't expect that. The first year uh, we competed at, uh, there's a, it's called the Student Technology Leadership Program. It's a Kentucky thing and students from across the state show off their technology programs. And we went with our help desk and we kept getting questions um, about this. And we realized there was a large interest there. So now our kids present every year at this at this uh, conference, um, and then our faculty, myself and two other folks, present every year at uh, the state technology conference for schools, and also the state career and technical education conference. And we've uh, been spreading the word. We, we're happy to learn that now we're not the only schools doing this. There's several schools in the state that have something similar. Uh, next slide, please. So. Um, we're still fairly new. We've only really had a, a, a full blood of apprenticeship for two years, but we have several students majoring in computer science, um, cybersecurity or programming. Um, we have several in engineering. Um, we have one of our graduates last year, This this I love this story because he went to a college about an hour and a half away. And uh, while he was there mentioned, oh, I, I have my um, apprenticeship completed to one of his professors and his the professor's wife worked at the local school district and said hey they need somebody so now he actually works part-time for the local school district doing the exact same thing he did while he was here in the apprenticeship fixing their computers while he's attending college and he makes pretty good money um we have um a graduate last year uh receive a they call it the pigman scholarship stanley pigman uh, he has everything paid for at UK University of Kentucky, our room board, books, tuition, everything for four years. Um, he was so happy to get that. And he attributes it to the, the what he learned at Help Desk because he's a, he's a computer engineering major. And one more quick story, <laughs> not on the slide, uh, a young lady who uh, had never been in Help Desk, wasn't even a computer major, joined a, uh, after school had started a week late last year and she didn't know what she wanted to do she she was a carpentry major um, but didn't really like it thought she'd give this a try she was really shy quiet and um she kind of fell in love with it and the first time i sent her off by herself there was a, there was a ticket come in for a, a, a computer that wasn't powering on and i said can you handle this and and she looked at me and she was scared to death, and but she nodded and said yes. And she went up, and then the teacher called me and said, who was that that just came and fixed my computer? Uh, apparently, she did a fantastic job, and she was polite, and she was professional and courteous. And this this student really excelled and is now a um, major at a local college in cybersecurity, and she also received 100% paid scholarship. So we're happy that we're producing students who can do this and are going into the field, uh, either in college or, or working. Um, we're very proud of them. Um, I'll say that really quickly, because we're K-12, uh, we, we thought about seeing what a pre-apprenticeship would work for us, how, how it could work. We have students who are interested in that, who, who are under 16 and can't work. So we've, we've got the bones in place for a pre-apprenticeship program. Um, it's not fully implemented yet, but we're going to, we think we're going to put that in place next year for our kids. Uh, so we're expanding. Um, we've made it work and there's been some challenges. Uh, the kids are learning soft skills as well as their technology skills. Uh, we're really proud of the program. Um, I wasn't sure this was going to work and it's worked. Um, that's it. Thank you.
Hi, my name is David Dorr. I'm the director of the Somerset Career and Tech Center in Skowhegan, Maine. I use this as in my introduction screen because it just continues to remind me of why we do what we do. That's my granddaughter. Um, because I spend most of my career in maintenance, this is going to be a nuts and bolts type of uh, introduction. So we'll we'll get moving. So next slide. So Somerset Career and Tech Center is in Western Maine. It's uh, we have five sending schools. We're, it's very rural. Our major employers are the school district that we work for, a local hospital, the paper mill, and New Balance uh, has a shoe factory in our area. But a lot of the businesses are wood products ones. So you see a lot of lumber trucks and whatnot rolling through the streets. I would say 60% of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch. And I think when I looked at SIDS, this, um, she had 91%, I think, of her kids graduate. And that's very high. As, and so we also have a high graduation rate. So 97% of students who attend our tech center, SETC, graduate from their sending schools and that's uh, and their normal graduation rate at their high school is, is about 80%. So we can elevate that graduation rate with what we do at the CTE. And students come to us every other day for the full day. One of the things that we just we do is we when I started there it was a regular CTE, right? Um, and so we had a change in philosophy a few years ago when we I attended a strategic uh, workshop for our, one of our sending schools. And one of the community members came to me and said, what would it take for any student who wanted to attend SETC the opportunity to do so? And so instead of trying to fill seats, we started to think about what would it take to create opportunities? Go ahead, next. So, um, really thinking about career pathways, um, giving students an opportunity to create a plan while they were with us, and then, then to begin working on that, their career goals while they're with us. So when kids leave, every student has a plan and is working towards that plan. And one of the things that, you know, we would like to see done is for their graduation requirements to be finished up by the end of their junior year, which would then leave their senior year open to things like early college uh, apprenticeships, you know, so they can start working on their pathway while they're still being supported by us. Next. So what do we ask? We ask our students, what do you want to be and how can we get you there? So this creates opportunities for each student based on their interests. We have an early college program. They can get, uh, we'll pay for their college both on campus and online while they're with us. We have an extended learning opportunities um, specialist who helps fill the gap between um, students who don't know what they wanna be and students that are ready for the apprenticeship. And then we have an apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeships, which is run by our workforce development coordinator. Next. So we'll talk about the apprenticeships and the pre-apprenticeships. That's what we're here for. Um, so creating opportunities. So SCTC has always tried to create work-based learning opportunities. We've always seen the value in that, but it was hard to figure out how, what that, how to make that happen. So we had the opportunity um, from Jobs for Maine graduates gave us a specialist. And my charge to that person was, how can we become an intermediary sponsor for apprenticeships? You know, and then I tasked them to do that. And so we had our first meeting with the Maine Department of Labor. And, and what I said at the beginning of that meeting was basically, I've heard you talking points. I you know, I think this is what we want to do, but let's talk about actionable steps leaving this. And so we had a great conversation and coming out of that, we figured out that a CTE basically has um, their programs, our programs qualify as pre-apprenticeships. So 
um, we had that going for us. We had a lot of community support. We had a lot of things going for us. So we, what we needed to do was partner with a local business. And that was the Sheridan Corporation, which is a construction company, wanted to partner with us. <clears throat> We needed some students that wanted to be apprenticeships. So we uh, found some students in welding and, and residential construction who were ready to make the next step. And so then we worked with the main department of labor to um, meet these requirements. And so, you know, create schedule of work, schedule of pay. And it only took a few months to uh, be approved to the main department of labor's um, apprenticeship council to become an intermediary. So once we got that started, once we got that certificate, it was easy to then add on other companies and other skills and more students. But once we got that intermediary um, sponsorship, uh, that was really the start of everything. Good, so next. Some of our numbers. Um, so like I said, we have a lot of support from our uh, local community one event we had was we had a business after hours through the local chamber of commerce at the school we had our culinary arts department um, create a meal and we had 75 uh, chamber members showed up including the commissioner of the main department of labor so that was a big night I got a lot of support got a lot of ideas and so currently we work with 12 different companies um three trades but we're growing them pretty quickly um we did a, a electrical and instrument trade earlier th this year through a paper company sappy paper we are working currently on an idea this young lady that was in our fire fighting program um, decided that she'd rather be a mortician so we have some people working to help her see that through um the opportunities that that gives us is you know, working on a plumbing apprenticeship on an automotive technology apprenticeship. We have um, seven students who have started an apprenticeship and two that have completed an apprenticeship. So we've, we're only a couple of years into this. And again, 32 students enrolling in our pre-apprenticeships. And that's going to just continue to grow because our electrical program uh, counts as a pre-apprenticeship. And those kids start to collect their um, electrical apprenticeship hours while they're with us. Next. <clears throat> so what are the benefits for the students? Well, so for instance, a couple of those students that started off initially with us, they can continue their training in the field of their choice. They gain experience. So we would say that student from um, residential construction, he got all the skills that we could teach him. Now what he needed was experience. So what we could do is hook him up with a local company, give him a mentor, he gets paid, he continues to earn graduation credit. And instead of coming to our program, he's on a job site, uh, just learning more and more through that mentorship. And then they get to track their hours as an apprentice before they graduate. And so the other thing for us is we don't need up to start a program to create an opportunity. And <clears throat> what I mean by that is, let's say we had some kids that wanted to go into plumbing, but not enough to really start a, a, a CTE program. What we can do is find a mentor for them and then they can learn that trade through on the job training through an, a pre-apprenticeship slash apprenticeship and get paid for what they're doing. Next. So what are the benefits for the business as well? You know, we talk about longevity. 90% um, <clears throat> of the apprentices, and this is a national um, statistic, are still employed at the company after one year. Um, I think recruiting students with training in a trade is a benefit. So instead of getting somebody right off the street, they get somebody with electrical training, residential construction, welding like all of those skills so they they don't come in green they're ready to go um setc as an intermediary takes the burden off the companies from so they don't have to create their own apprenticeship we do that you know we're already the intermediary so all they need to do is give us a mentor and this really helps out small businesses 
And then again, what we've heard stories of older workers really enjoying sharing their knowledge with the next generation, because a lot of those those that generation is ready to retire and they want to be able to hand off their trade to people who really want to do it. So what's the next slide? So for us, <clears throat> really the SETC, again, we don't have to create a new program if a student is interested. Like we're not going to create a um, mortuary program for that student who wants to be more mortician. But we can help that student go along their path by creating this opportunity. Um, students, they don't need to be in a program at SCTC to access um, our opportunities. We're open to all of the students in our catchment area and we have five sending schools. And students are likely to stay in the area and contribute to the economy if we can just, um, you know, keep get them engaged in, uh, in what they want to do locally. Next. The other thing for the students is they're getting paid. They're getting hired by that company. And so one of the one of the ideas that we when we started this, somebody said we should do a signing like um, you know a school like a student getting a student uh, athletic scholarship or something. So that's what we did. We so this is a picture of a kid that wanted to get into construction. So we we hooked him up with Sheridan Construction. We met at Sheridan in the conference room. There's the president, myself, the the student, and his parents, and uh, some others that supported us. And then, you know, we had a conversation. The student signed the forms. I signed it. The parents signed. The president signed. And then that student um, went directly into onboarding. And they gave him a bunch of swag. We took some pictures. And so we make it a big deal because it really is a big deal. Next. So this is a picture of a student who finished their um, apprenticeship. One of the earlier ones with, that we got into was um, banking. So we, we don't have a banking program, but we had students that were interested in, in banking. We also had some banks that needed people. And so this young lady started um, working at Sky Weekend Savings, went through their apprenticeship in uh, personal banking. And then we went down when she finished it with her certificate and uh, made a big deal out of it. And so we've had a couple of those in banking. Next. Um, so this, this was a success that I want to share is we had SAPI, which is a local um, pulp and paper company. And they came to see us about a year or so ago and asked about our apprenticeship program. And in the conversations with them, they decided to start their own apprenticeship program. So we helped them through that. But what they wanted us to do is to create the pre-apprenticeship program so that we had students then coming out of our school that they could then recruit and go into their apprenticeship programs. And so this is a picture of two students that went through that your apprenticeship program and e and i is for electrical and instrumentation which is automation process control that kind of stuff and so these two students went through the pre-apprenticeship program they're going to a community college to continue their studies but then sappy hired them to as apprenticeships so they're apprentices so they're going to be on board with them starting in the fall as they're going to emcc and also working and getting their hours and the the young man on the left in the gray shirt when he graduated he had 3500 hours um, already accumulated in the apprenticeship program because he worked for as an electrician's helper you know his junior and senior year so a lot of benefits for students next So I, I do have to do a shout out. The main Department of Labor, their main apprenticeship program has been instrumental, more like a partner. They've been a huge help. So anytime we have a question uh, um, that, that either uh, a business brings up to us or we have that we're trying to do, they have been super in getting back to us and not telling us what to do, but partnering with us to help us walk, you know, get those things done that we need to do for students. All right, last slide. Nothing that we do at the Tech Center um, significantly is done alone. We have to, we collaborate a lot with 
our sending schools, with our community partners. And this is just a, a list of some of those people that have helped us along the way. All right, I think I'm done. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. Thank you Sid, so much. Yeah. Yes. And Andrew, um, Natalie, if you want to go ahead and take down the slides, um, Sid, Andrew, David, you can come back on camera and we'll go into the Q&A. Feel free to keep dropping questions in the chat um, as you have them. And Miriam, I'll let you take it away with the first question, although I think Andrew started the, to answer it yet, but we can still talk about it. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, thank you so much for those insightful presentations. Your programs really sound awesome. And so let's start with the questions. Um, we have, okay, Andrew already answered one in the chat, but let's, yeah, like Mary said, let's talk about it in the group. So Bianca asked, has bringing in these technology programs visibly increased your amount of students interested in technology? Andrew, that's for you. Um, yes, uh, we have. We already had a um, a design a web design program in place, and we had um, AP Computer Science, which is mostly programming. But not all, all all of our kids have those skills. We have a lot of kids who like hands on, and we saw those students come out of the woodwork. The ones who, the tinkerers, the ones who, who wanted to fix things and, and touch the computers and tear them open, came to our program. There was a there was a, an interest there that we didn't know we had. So yes, definitely. It's great to hear. Next question in the chat we have is from Adriel who asks, and this is for each of you. So maybe Sid, if you'd like to go first and then we can go down the line. What is the starting age or grade for each of your programs? So we serve youth um, ages 16 to 24. And I may not have mentioned, we do have partnerships with Los Angeles Unified School District. So we source our youth from um, school districts. We're partnering with another continuation kind of alternative school. So youth in our pre-apprenticeship um, range from 16 to 19 and youth in our apprenticeship program are 18 uh, and up. So the same for us, for our apprenticeship, um, 16 and over. Um, we have, um, you know, there are some sophomores who are already 17. And if, if they're 17 and a sophomore and they want to come into the program, sure. But but the majority for us are juniors and seniors because they, they meet that age requirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're the same. We have a nine through 12 um, school, but most of the students that are in our early college and, and uh, apprenticeship programs are juniors and seniors. We have a next question from Amy Laufer. She's asking, have any of the programs accessed federal funds that were mentioned in the beginning? And maybe just to clarify that a little bit too, I had mentioned a couple of US Department of Labor, Gra Labor Grants at the top, Apprenticeships Building America, the State Apprenticeship Expansion Funds. You may not know um, exactly what grant you're getting funding from, um, but we had another question coming in about who or what agency is, you know, helping pay for, or is there an agency in the state helping you pay for? So could you just talk about how your programs are funded broadly, maybe? Well, I do a lot of prayer and rain dances, but lately, um, <laughs> uh, lately uh, funding is coming through the state. So as I mentioned, the state just created a, um, a COYA grant, which is the Opportunity Youth Apprenticeship Grant, which we received funding our first state uh, grant that I believe is federally funded. And we work with local workforce development agencies. So we have partners with South Bay Workforce Investment Board, who we become sub-recipients of the ABA DLL OL grant. But I do want to mention that as a, you know, a grassroots organization, managing federal grants is a, is a separate skill set. It, you need technical mm -hmm. assistance for it because it's on a reimbursable model. Um, and so I think when you, you're going after federal funding, it's important to incorporate technical assistance in your budget so that you understand that the deliverables need to be delivered before you're paid for the services. So that's important um, as an organization. To... We were pretty uh, fortunate as a school, we have that support anyway but when we became intermediary sponsors it really set us up <clears throat> in a good spot to receive the that grants 
and we got our grant through the main department of labor and that's how we're paying our workforce development uh, coordinator and i like to say too the difference you know we're an intermediary as well and we're also a training provider so you can get funding for both you know being the intermediary that's a sponsor of the program and the training provider and us we're, at, being a CTE, a career and technical education school, we do get some state funding just for our programs, but it's it's shared among all the programs. Um, but some of that helps. But again, we are so grateful right now. The Wilderness Education Project grant is helping us um, pay our apprentices, and that's that's wonderful. That's fantastic. I'd like yeah. to just say, Andrew, I'm so interested in your apprentices. Like we have a tech lab in South LA. And so we do a tech distribution mm -hmm. and we need to hire some youth. So I'd love to talk to you offline because we do a tech distribution mm -hmm. and we have some um, installations of Adobe software. So I don't know if we could hire an apprentice who could do some remote installations for us, but I'd love to explore a possibility of working together. Let's, let's talk. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we have um, a few more questions in the chat. Um, one other question is in the manufacturing area, is there any age limit due to safety? So and we've done a lot. I think um, our kids are out in manufacturing. They're on construction sites. Uh, they're in doing fabrication, those kinds of things. And, and yes, so that always seems to be a hurdle and lead that people like to bring up is but at being a CTE, those kids are already um, have skills. And so there are um, some flexibility with students coming out of CTEs because they do have those skills. And, you know, that's that's one of those areas that we talked a lot with the main Department of Labor about. They will let us know what, you know, where the flexibilities are and where they're not. A lot of times it's not with the statute, it's more with the insurance companies. And so if we can have that conversation about students being with mentors, being already trained, having the skills, then that minimizes the liability um, for the company and the school. And, and for us, the students are being hired by that company. So, um, you know, they're going through the same onboarding and they're covered by their, their insurance as well. So. Um, I think we have it pretty well covered. We we want the kids to be safe. And then we have time for one last question. This is from Kathy Dixon. Hi, Kathy. Um, David, are there any other apprenticeship opportunities that y'all are looking at outside of the technical field at technical fields at the CTE Center? So we are open to a conversation from any student who has a passion. And so that's how we got into banking. We don't have a banking program. Um, you know, we're working on the mortician thing. The E&I thing was outside of what we do. So uh, if a student comes to us, we're going to pursue that through our ELO uh, coordinator and through our workforce development person. Because we, you know, again, what do you want to be and how can we get you there? Instead of putting seats in, you know, kids into a seat, we want to create those opportunities that they want to do. Because when we find out that they're engaged in the, into their own career pathway, th I think that's why we have such a high graduation rate, because they're doing what they want to do, right? They're moving down their pathway. Awesome. Thank you all so much for all these questions. We're very efficient with our panelists, too. So thank you all for your um, answer so we could get through all of these. Natalie, could you please put the slides back up real quick um, from the upcoming webinar slide and I will close this out real quick. So thank you one more time to our three panelists for sharing so much about your programs. Um, glad that you even have something to learn from each other. That's so exciting. Um, we just wanted to highlight a couple of upcoming webinars um, to be a um, announce the exact dates, but just a preview of what's to come with the CSG DAG USA partnership. Mm -hmm. In October, we'll be doing an event on policy strategies to promote youth apprenticeship. And in November, um, this will be a good one, artificial intelligence and its implications for registered apprenticeship. Miriam? Yeah, I just want to say thank you again as well to our panelists and to the audience and thank our funders. 
the Federal Foreign Ministry and the Goethe Institute to make those webinars happen. Thank you. And next slide, last one. If you would like to follow up with myself, Miriam, or any of our three panelists today, our contact information is here on this slide. You can snap a picture real quick. But like I said, sometime next week, you'll get this slide deck as well with all this information. So with that, we are exactly at three o'clock. Thank you very much again for your time this afternoon and please enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>